Bitcoin Group, the American original. For over the last 10 years, the sharpest Satoshis, the best Bitcoins, the hardest cryptocurrency talk. We'd like to welcome our panelists, Victoria Jones from Satoshi's page. Good evening, everybody. Oh, we're frozen again. Oh, the internet is broken from broken internet. Have All you right, tried back, turning it on and back off again? Back to the wired connection. <laughs> the Bitcoin Group, the American original. For over the last 10 years, the sharpest Satoshis, the best Bitcoins, the hardest cryptocurrency talk. We'd like to welcome our panelists, Victoria Jones from Satoshi's page. Good evening, everybody. Josh Shigala from the standard.io. Let's roll. Internet. Like try what about a hotspot on from your phone? I mean I'm at I'm at home. I have fantastic fiber optic internet. Fantastic yeah, until you well, want to use it. Until you want to use it. Try it. Yeah, but hotspots are good. They're hot. I guess we'll just keep going. And threesome from the grotto. How's it going, threesome? I think I'm back now. All right, you're back. Well, I'm I'm back as well. Thanks for having me again, Thomas. All right, let's try to keep going. We don't know what's going on with the internet today. Moving on to issue one. Issue one, crypto analysts outline Bitcoin price to $220,000 in 2024. It's not just me, you, and Adam back predicting the price of Bitcoin anymore. It's major analysts at major firms launching major tweets with large prices. Victoria Jones, what do you think about the idea that Bitcoin could not lose? What do you reckon, Victoria? I'll just carry on regardless, shall I? Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, there's a lot of hype. There's a lot of hype around this at the moment. You know, a lot of people are predicting um, the price going to the moon, and uh, that's not unusual in Bitcoin. This happens. Uh, from time to time. Normally, though, when it gets to the stage where everyone's predicting that it's about to go up, then uh, something's shocking. Oh. Thomas, we lost you. <laughs> I knew I should have stayed in bed. <laughs> <laughs> no. uh, the old hotspot usually works best for me. I think I, we're still live. Mind. Guys, I think we're still live. Really? So I will carry on. Um, so, yes, uh, this is uh, fairly typical for this stage of uh, Bitcoin's. Well, not necessarily this stage of Bitcoin's price cycle, but normally, you know, often when uh, everyone's predicting it's about to go to the moon, that's the point at which, you know, things can turn around and uh, pull, and pull the rug and pull the rug out from under your feet. So, um yeah, I, I would always be I would always be careful. I mean, I don't I personally until there's some kind of catastrophe that breaks the existing financial system, anything could happen in Bitcoin. So I'd never get too confident on the way up. I'd never get too scared on the way down. I think anything could happen, really. Let's go to Josh Shigala. I think I'm back for a minute anyway. You we'll are. We'll it's you. magic. Magic <laughs> Zoom. It's, uh, well, <clears throat> yeah, I just love how these random analysts come up and, <laughs> and give a random number. <laughs> it's, it's, it, it really makes my day. I, I love these articles. You could just have analyst predicts, you know, $2 million. Like, I don't know. Yeah, it's good. 220. Sure. <laughs> like you're dividing infinity by 21 million so it can just be any number really uh <laughs> i don't know <laughs> let's see let's see what happens i i hope so that'd be pretty cool um yeah let's do it where would you well, and, sell and chat? josh where they've gotten even uh even lazier at writing these articles to where they just kind of quote someone on twitter you used to go to someone call them on the phone get a quote write it down ask some follow-up questions now it's just analyst guy on twitter tweets large price <laughs> prediction 
and guy guy who writes articles writes article about price prediction there's no work anymore there's no substance to these articles yeah and thank god it's not pronounced analyst right. lucky for that guy's job would be tons worse but yes i agree josh it's mainly about if bitcoin works and the proposition works and there's only 21 million coins and it's locked at that the price is almost impossible to predict because it could go so large but everyone just yeah. keeps putting in these kind of penny added predictions like it's 70 now it could go to 80 it could go to 100 you know <laughs> and you're like but if it yeah. works it could redefine value for the entire universe right i mean it could go to millions and millions of dollars <laughs> a coin and, and to say that now mm. is to predict something to say it'll go to 80 yeah. is like saying it'll go to 75. i mean I'm, I'm not impressed but they keep writing these articles you know no, uh, i think we're back i think the internet just started working again which makes no sense it drives me crazy uh but let's go to threesomes your thoughts on Bitcoin to two hundred and twenty thousand dollars a coin. Well, I think that's the number of the week, right? And if you go back just a few months, we were clamoring for a hundred thousand because we were down to you know below fifty. I, I think you know when it comes down to it, we have people talking about it that haven't been talking about it for years, which is the big difference. And I think that's what you're seeing. These, you know, even if it's a Twitter analyst, which is just a step below a, a market analyst, if we're if we're honest. Um, they have as much information at their fingertips as the next guy. They're just going to say a number. And the, the fact is, though, that more people are saying numbers, which is, I think, the interesting takeaway here. You know, I, I know in, in, in my side, even though, you know, we we do have plenty of, of Bitcoin, uh, you know, on, on the Bitcoin side, I've got collectors and, and groups of and members of the group that are really into to that side. But just as much, we're talking about it, even guys who don't own a single Bitcoin. It's there, it's present. It's uh, it's sort of on the tip of everybody's tongue for the last couple of months. So I think that's the big change. The numbers. I'm being right. told in the chat that even discussing the price of Bitcoin is causing the price to go down. But fortunately, we're joined by the only analyst on the internet that knows what's going to happen before it happens. The Magic Eight Ball, the true predictor of Bitcoin, and now you are forced to predict against the Magic Eight Ball. Poor you. Victoria Jones, will the price of Bitcoin be higher or lower this time next week? Last week, all the analysts on this show, well, we weren't here, but the week before, they said higher. It went lower, like the ball said. Higher or lower? Well, you know, I hate to disrupt a good trajectory, so I'll keep going with lower then. <laughs> Josh Shigala, higher or lower this time next week? I don't know, but does this make me an analyst? You I'm could be sure. written Let's about see, it in I, Twitter articles, but it would be a lot easier if you were the founder of Dogecoin. All they seem to do is write right. about everything that guy uh, spits out of his mouth. Yeah. That, that guy says, yeah. <laughs> higher! Let's go. And let's go to threesome. We've got higher and lower, kind of a mixed panel so far. Which way are you going to go? Um, well, I'm going to say that we're going to be higher than today. Yes. higher and now predicting against the ball will the price of bitcoin be higher this time next week remember if you shake one of these balls it could cause bubbles will it be higher very doubtful very doubtful so the ball Ooh. is pessimistic moving on to issue two issue two the upcoming bitcoin halving is different from others before it here's what investors need to know josh shigala the media is here and they're here to tell you everything about Bitcoin, even if you've been in it for years. What's different about this Bitcoin having than the last ones? Well, it's starting off the same because this is, these are the exact same articles that have popped up just before every single halvening. So, <laughs> so uh, that's it's sort of some sort of self-referencing joke. But um, yeah, it, it actually... I think it could be a little bit different. I think it could be right, actually, because the these ETFs have caused the spike, the price to spike beforehand. Usually, it collapses beforehand. Uh, who knows why? Uh, usually, it's because people think that it, the halving is all priced in, and then they want to sort of you know sell the news. And uh, actually, the news is, guys, there's less of this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not really news. It's just a more of a quantifiable fact. 
and uh, it's quantifiable through the price going up eventually because miners need to uh, pay for the electricity. You know, mining has always been a, a job for holding. It, even when Bitcoin was $1, $30, stuff like that, um, it was always, it was never profitable at the moment of mining the stuff. You had to hold it for a bit longer until you uh, had enough of it, until the price caught up to where you needed it. So generally, uh, miners have uh, really strong hands and they don't let go until they can afford to sell it um, or go broke. So that's usually what miners do. And, uh, and and there's different techniques. You know, you can hold it, you can turn off your mining rig so you don't have any more bills, uh, but you still hold the Bitcoin to pay for the for the electricity that you'd uh, uh, consumed uh, earlier. So yeah, I, I think that at the end of the day is what happens to the price. Uh, but now with BlackRock consuming nine, uh, what, 10,000 Bitcoins a day, that's just one ETF. We've got nine of these suckers. And uh, then you've got the other ETFs starting to um, make murmurs. There's one in Australia starting to pop up. There's ones uh, in Europe. So uh, there's just not enough of these things around, literally. And now that we're heading towards from six, uh, whatever it is, 6.4 or five, down to like three and a half Bitcoin every 10 minutes being released and and BlackRock wants 10,000 of them uh, per day. Yeah. Yeah, someone's something's got to give and that's probably going to be the price yeah my favorite article around these times is the halvening is priced in and they tell you all the reasons why nothing's going to happen this time and the price has always gone up and then there's always those people that sell immediately after they're having they're like nothing happened it's supposed to go up that day and then about three months six months nine months whatever it's going to be later Everything goes up and everything's fine and everyone retrospectively changes all their articles and deletes all their negative tweets. Uh, let's go to yeah. threesomes. What do you think about the Bitcoin having? Is it different this time? As Josh says, we have ETFs causing major demand. The media is aware of it this time, um, but I don't know that people really understand the, the dynamics and the basic reality that having is happening. I, I think, you know, like Josh said, it's, it's certainly a lot more people in the know now and when you factor in the etfs it's a it's going to be a major move into them with this you know the smaller amount available but to me the question that i have really for the group because i wasn't around celebrating the last two happenings right um you know we were joking about it before we came on a little bit but i imagine it was just you know early on it was just the the real cognizant getting together and being like you know this is about to get exciting for us now, when we're talking about the ETFs and all of the major corporations involved in this, starting to celebrate and celebrate in the media because it's a part of the narrative, is it something that probably Victoria sees it more than anybody, but is it something that we're seeing a real you know, celebration? Is this a festive atmosphere going into the coming days? Or uh, a, a lot of this, I mean, I got to go first with my sour grapes because, again, we had our cool little thing. And we were the hip inside Bitcoin people. And now the media is here and the big businesses and all the cool people are here. And uh, we are not invited. We are not invited to any of the major parties. We haven't heard from anybody. Nobody's saying, here's $5,000. You had really cool having parties like the last two times. We want you guys to rent a ballroom or whatever. Haven't heard that. Um, so the cool kids are here. They're having their own cool kid parties. And uh, we're not really invited. Uh, so that's changed. Uh, but again, our, our initial investment thesis, our belief in Bitcoin is still strong and it doesn't really matter. But yes, as far as being cool and hip, that's not us. Uh, let's go to uh, Victoria. What do you think about the having this time and the parties and such uh, as threesomes asking? I think we'll always be cool, Thomas, even if we're any cool in our own little niche. So, you know, don't don't worry. <laughs> You know, and these things always come back. These things always come back around. So, you know, and there's a lot of benefit from wisdom and kind of being there, uh, seen it, done it. I mean, you know, I mean, I remember in 2017, the the media were getting all excited about Bitcoin. And this was just before it crashed again. And I don't know. In, I know that the halving normally anticipates a big run up in the price. But as you've said, you know, sometimes the halving will happen. It'll be a couple of months. It'll be a few months before it really starts to take off. So given how much hype there is, 
from a lot of new people in the space who don't really understand what's going on, you know, the, the massive disappointment could actually lead to a huge crash, you know, because as you say, you know, they expect it to go up straight away. They've heard all these things about the halving. Uh, in many respects, it's probably already priced in. Uh, and so they're all uh, disappointed and us oldies will be sitting there going, told you. <laughs> so, uh, you know, and if nothing else, that will make you cool again. So, um, yeah, I mean, we've kind of been there, done that, seen it. Um, and as I've said many times before, I don't think the fact that Wall Street's involved in this party is necessarily a good thing because, as, you know, because they've got such resources as far as they can run it up, they can also run it down. Um, and in the broader financial system, you know, there are murmurings of trouble on the horizon. I mean, a lot of people have been predicting rate cuts, but with inflation going up, a lot of people are saying those are now not on the table and a lot of the rise in the stock market and consequently also the rise in Bitcoin will be tied to the fact that a cut in the interest rates could also could uh you know indicate that uh you know the stock market's going to start rising again so if they're going to actually keep uh interest rates high that could actually have uh, a huge huge implications in terms of money velocity in the economy so even though they're actually creating money behind the scenes the higher interest rates slow it down and there are murmurs of problems in the commercial property markets and stuff like that you know if we have a huge crisis in the traditional financial system, Bitcoin will take a hit because as good as the technology is, not everyone under people are only just starting to understand it. They don't fully understand it. And if there's a sudden shock, um, you know, a lot of people could be blindsided by that. So, yeah, I don't know. I think uh, I think it's going to be a roller coaster. The exact timing of it is really hard to predict, but it's going to be a roller coaster. I can tell you that much. Well, it very much takes me back to my high school economics class, and I think I was taught by the wrestling coach. Uh, but still, when you reduce supply and you reduce potential supply by 50%, it doesn't instantly increase demand, right? People still have Bitcoin on stock. They don't have to go buy it right away. It's not like their existing savings or anything goes down by half. So the idea that people think it's going to take off right away, like Victoria said, from the having, like even people like planning their parties for midnight or whatever and pretending it's new year's eve and they'll look at their watches and their investment will double or triple like at that very minute like that's not going to happen and again if you're the media or if you're planning one of these star-studded fantastic parties with all the analysts who've bought you brought you nothing but truth about bitcoin for the past decade you can rewind to them telling you it was only drug money and that it's disgusting and a pet rock and all these horrible things they said for years but again they're they're on it now uh, so that doesn't, you know, it erases the past. Uh, but Josh Shigala, have you been invited to any star-studded parties? Uh, I was invited to a party by our, our friend, famous Bitcoin singer Tatiana Moroz, uh, but nothing from CNBC, uh, nothing from uh, Grayscale or uh, ETF, BlackRock, any of these people, no one, no one banging my door down. And, and again, you know, like we have threesomes here, so I need to brag, you know, I'm a famous NFT artist sold in Christie's and Sotheby's. Still no invitations. Still no invitations. <laughs> hey, it reminds me a lot of the Revenge of the Nerds quadrilogy. Um, uh, you cannot, you know, you can't take the nerd out of the nerd. <laughs> it doesn't matter uh, what happens in life. You'll still be the nerds. Um, <laughs> uh, anyway, I, uh, yeah, uh, look, the, the, the having having parties have always been fun. I, I don't know what's happening actually uh, this time around. I, I I've got to make some calls. I'll probably hang with. Well, well obviously we don't want to over promote it here, but of course we're going to have our World Crypto Network hang out like always, and people can come and they could drop by, and you could even go to other parties. We're not like uh, exclusive. You know, you have to sign a contract with us. You won't go to any other parties. We're not doing that. Um, but yeah, no, we'll do our thing, Josh. But the the bigger people will do their things and they'll have bigger financial people and they'll probably tell you yeah. how many millions of dollars you could make right on that show, maybe even in the thumbnail, like one of those. You'll make a million dollars when yeah. I open my mouth. So yeah. it's never too late. <laughs> I, uh, I I wonder what time it's going to be this this year. Uh, that That's the other thing, you know, being... Australia is always at the arse end of every time zone. It doesn't matter. It's either really late or really early. Uh, so, <laughs> um, but yeah, I, you know, 
traditionally it's always been a fun time uh, for sure and uh and eventually something happens i i i've never been uh one to know what's going on until the last minute when someone says hey josh come and join us um but uh yeah there, there's been there's been a couple of really good live streams over the years where uh people join in and and you get everyone from uh you know what's his name from twitter uh jack dorsey and that was still while he was censoring everyone about bitcoin so you know <laughs> like twitter was actively shadow banning uh and and canceling people because they were talking about bitcoin um because it was seen as so uh, uh so so many scams and stuff like that uh, that that was at the time when uh, facebook banned it uh Google banned any advertising, Twitter banned any advertising. And when they said advertising, also anyone talking about it. So um, uh, yet he, Jack Dorsey would pop up on some of these parties. That's how like excited people got. So uh, <laughs> yeah, we'll see what happens now. If we're going to see Larry Fink there. Yeah, Harving. Uh, we'll probably see Mr. Wonderful from Shark Tank. Like uh, these are all the types of you know noobs that come along, and everyone celebrates them uh, because they've got deeper pockets, I guess, uh, or traditional traditional deeper pockets. I'm not sure. Uh, they surely weren't visionaries uh, at the start, or maybe they because I, I have heard some of these people in the past actually crap all over Bitcoin and then turn around. Uh, Jamie Dimon is a typical one. Like he. He he'll sometimes say good things. Well, he'll do good things like uh, you know, launch an ETF or something, which you know it's arguably a good thing. And uh, uh, but publicly he'll crap all over it. I think even uh, uh, what's his name, uh, the the gold guy, uh, Peter Schiff. Peter Shifty, Peter Shifty. Uh, he's uh, uh, you know his son's all over Bitcoin, but he isn't. You know, anyway. Parties. Well, we can we can only imagine, Josh, that everyone's coming around, and that in another four years we'll have a live stream with Mister Wonderful, Mark Cuban, Jamie Dimon, the head of the Federal Reserve, and we'll all reminisce about how stupid they thought we were for decades and decades and decades. So, I think I think yeah. we answered your question there, threesome. But no, not not expecting any major party invites yet. Um, but remember, at its core, what's amazing about this event, and we've watched it a couple of times here. I wish I'd been there <laughs> three or four times. Uh, that would have been amazing. But at its core, you're going to watch a screen, and it's going to be putting out blocks. And let's just say it's like a five reward block. It's going to go to five, 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 two point five, two point five, two point five, and that's it. That's the entire event. Obviously, the numbers are different. It's going from three to 1.5 or something in that range. I don't, I forgot the exact number, but yeah, it's, it's hardly an event. And then you look at, at the price and your wallet and everything. And you're like, it's going to go and nothing happens because people have Bitcoin. They haven't run out yet. Like supply squeeze is not instant, but it's amazing when you do cut production by 50%. No one else, no one else does that. No one but Bitcoin. Uh, but let's move on to the next issue. Check out World Crypto Network at worldcryptonetwork.com. We've got hundreds, maybe even thousands of videos like this. You can click on the On This Day button and find out what videos we made on this day in the past, 2018, 16, 15, even 2014. All for free on worldcryptonetwork.com. Moving on to issue three, Van X CEO says brokerage platforms aren't recommending Bitcoin ETFs. There's a long way to go. I don't know what it will take to get these people to understand Bitcoin. It's on their own platform. They make all the brokerage fees for it. They profit by selling it. And yet they aren't recommending it to their customers yet. They're buying it in boatloads. As Josh said, they're buying more Bitcoin that are made every day than exist, but they're not recommending it yet. Victoria Jones, what do you think about these uh, risk adverse financial advisors who aren't recommending bitcoin yet and the fact that if they do start recommending it then there'd be huge demand inside the etfs well i mean i do you know in spite of the fact that i think uh wall street is largely run by arrogance and hubris i think there are a few who do understand the danger that bitcoin poses to the existing financial system you know at the moment the existing financial system is 
run by numbers you know since uh, money lost its tie to gold it's kind of loosely been tied to oil and then even more loosely tied to debt uh there's nothing uh verifying those numbers on wall street at all and of course bitcoin comes along uh with its verifiable mechanism that disrupts all of that um and so i think there are some who understand that very well and it may well take time before that has an effect but that's going to have huge implications that I think some of them understand, but maybe not everyone. I don't think everyone understands what the implications of this will be. Um, and uh, for some people, it's quite scary. So uh, it's a bit of a double edged sword, really. I mean, there are some people who are excited about it because they uh, believe that the price will go up, which it will for those who hold it and even more so for those who hold, hold a lot. So that's an incentive. But the wider implications of what Bitcoin does in in terms of what it's designed to do. I don't think even Wall Street fully understands the implications of that yet. Well, and I just think that's great. I think that's an advantage for our side and everything. And I love the idea that they'd have some worry about bringing it in. But at the same time, that guy's making money and that guy's making money and that guy's making money. And there's only yeah. a matter of time before they got to let it in, right? Yeah, the greed will get them in the end. And that's what we're all relying on. <laughs> it's a beautiful, the end, beautiful it's system. The key, is that because they'll recommend it right at the top. Well, and like we've said before, they have the money to make it go up. They have the money to make it go down. Josh Shigala, what do you think? They're not even recommending these things yet, yet they're buying hand over fist every day. These are the financial advisors you can trust. These are the guys on CNBC that you want to give your money to every day. No problem. Yeah, financial advisors have never been keen on Bitcoin uh, purely because of the, the massive volatility that's always been there. And so it, it, it's, it's generally largely a bottom, bottom up um, industry. You know, it's where with the grassroots bought ignoring all craziness being reckless as with their money and and then the uh the lawyers and the vcs come in and then later you know uh the the institutions and governments and so it's it's really been the other way around and that's uh that that's always been a fact and and so when you get financial advisors right now telling you don't buy it that's just because they don't know is tomorrow going to be the crash so they're just scared uh the fact is that people see their mates uh they talk about it around the fireplace at the pub um and they're like man i i think i should just buy a little bit and if you have um access to leverage through wall street um tooling then now with these etfs you can go long pretty pretty well uh and you can put some of 401k pretty easily and all these other things so um i, th I think it's only a, a a matter of time where pe people just tend to ignore their the analysis and buy it anyway yeah but uh, we've said it before on the show as well what happens is that when Bitcoin, when you should actually buy Bitcoin is when no one's talking about it. When it's right down, that it, they remove it off the ticker on CNN, on NBC, they remove it from all the mainstream media because it's right down, it's boring as hell. And then when everyone starts talking about it is when it's really all-time highs and your phone's blowing up saying, hey, I've heard you talk about this stuff. Can you help me buy some? And uh, you have to ignore it because if you help them right now, they'll they'll also blame you when it when it crashes. Uh, so you know, th there's all sorts of uh, it's 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 a really annoying. I've just stopped recommending it altogether all the time, except for when it's right down low. <laughs> That's when I'm like, hey, by the way, have you thought of Bitcoin <laughs> or Ethereum or any you know like the, some major blue chip technological advancement in this space? It is amazing, Josh. They're going to wait, wait right until the end to recommend it. After all the ETF hype, all the happening hype, just at the end, they'll be like, hey, maybe you should buy Bitcoin, right? Right when it goes yeah. down. Let's go to threesomes. What do you think about the ETFs not even recommending it yet, despite all the massive sales that we've seen? 
Well, I, I think that it's still just a sliver of their broader portfolio, right? And so, look, blockchain's a little scary when it comes to, to this sort of speculation in the sense of it's being finite and transparent and Bitcoin in particular, right? That you can you can see what you're up against. And most of the financial markets play in all sorts of obfuscation and manipulation and and that's the broader speculative play in most investment, right? And so to imagine that these companies that have made their entire, you know, business out of that sort of a, a space where it can't be tracked and it can't be you know, acknowledge that what's truly what, what you know, what makes up the, the true value there when there's so much manipulation, it's hard to wean them off of that. And I think that's what it comes down to more than anything is a, it's just a little sliver of, of what they're, they're putting out there, but B it has a lot less that they can sort of play with uh, opposed to the fact that, you know, it's, it's right there. The ledger and the blockchain tell tells all. And I think it's going to take some time before we get to a point where the stability of it, holds through and then they're a little more comfortable with it. But in the time being, I mean, I think they'd rather play with things that are are a lot cloudier than something as, as cut and dry and, and obvious. Well, and they also don't get those sweet kickbacks. You know, the doctors get all those free pens with all the different kind of drugs on them. They don't have that uh, pharmacy rep coming around saying, hey, you need to represent the Bitcoin. You know, if you promote the Bitcoin to your next 10 clients, we can get you some sweet box seats at the next game. Nobody does that for Bitcoin. Satoshi never calls anybody up. And if you want to put in a million dollars, $10 million, no free seats, no pretty girls, no free pens, nothing. No promotion at all. I don't know how we're going to make it anywhere. Let's move on to the next issue. A really quick one here. Hong Kong is seen as approving Bitcoin and Ethereum ETFs as soon as Monday. This might even have caused the price of Bitcoin to take off. Uh, but like Josh said earlier, we are seeing international ETFs, not just America, and perhaps for both Bitcoin and Ethereum. Uh, let's just go really fast. Josh Shigala, what do you think? Hong Kong uh, ETFs. Yeah, yeah. It was only a matter of time. And then there'll also be uh, Ethereum ETFs. So there'll be other ETFs. So it's, um, uh, yeah, it's only a matter of time. So get on there. They'll, they'll, yeah. Uh, Hong Kong, Australia. Um, Europe. They're, they're the major hubs. And let's go to threesomes. Do you think this will be the beginning or the end of international ETFs? Will other countries catch on to this obvious uh, financial benefits? Yeah, I think it puts it like 10 or 11 countries that, that have ETFs that are offered and there's 200 countries out there. I mean, not all of them have a you know market trading, but obviously I think it's the tip of the iceberg. More to come. And and let's go to Victoria. I know you're not a fan of the ETFs, but the virus is spreading worldwide, as predicted previously on this show many times. Once the banks went, they'd all go like dominoes, uh, whether it's in their interests or not, whether they did the research or not. Think of the FTX disaster. Uh, we now doubt that they even do any work at all, even the smallest bit of due diligence. Uh, you know, Johnny was in and Freddie was in and, and Paul, they all invested too. Uh, but what do you think now we have the the virus going international. Certainly seems like it. They all love a good bandwagon, don't they? So uh, all jumping on. <laughs> and then there'll be like lemmings going off at the same time. It's just like, watch out below. <laughs> that will be the best point when they're making Bitcoin and crypto illegal. And we're saying, hey, just a few years ago, you had us on Wall Street. You had everyone out and they, they pushed the button. They rang the bell. They pulled the switch. And they're like, forget, forget, forget back into the box. And we've got I, some I other, one, uh, go ahead, Josh. Just just quickly before we move forward, I, I think one, one of the biggest parts of the story is when we have another global financial crisis, um, it will probably be the Bitcoin ETFs that will be able to bail in uh, all of all of it. So um, we, could, we could see these uh, massive hordes of Bitcoin being able to be used to bail uh, out by the entire system uh, if it got that big remember these are all custodial of all of them and um and so yeah it's 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 quite a danger to the whole it's it's quite quite an uh quite a danger actually to, to have these and what the first big news event i'll be waiting for is first bitcoin etf to be hacked um 
and and drained in one foul swoop. So it's only a, a you know because all of these all of these are holding coins on a major exchange. We all know what happens when you hold your coins on a major exchange. Um, the, the likelihood of being hacked goes up a lot. Sure, they might have a multi-sig or something like that, but if you get too intense with your security, you could also screw that up and never have access to it again. So it's either going to be, we've lost the keys, we don't know how to access it because we were too secure, or we weren't secure enough and we've been hacked. So this is the problem. This is why I've never been a big fan of things like ETFs or things like governments holding Bitcoin because uh, it's there's too many players involved in securing your own thing. Bearer-based assets in general, like gold or traditional bearer-based assets, are quite easy because humans understand how to hold physical things pretty well and have authority over those. But digital assets are so new, digital security is so new, it's very, very difficult uh, to hold on a mass. So yeah, it'll be interesting. It'll be very, very interesting to uh, see the first Bitcoin ETF hack. Well, and when the first Bitcoin ETF is hacked, Josh, they'll have my absolute favorite conversation. They'll say, how many Bitcoin did they take? I'll say, well, they took them all, sir. It's like, how many trucks did they have? No trucks, sir. It was all one transaction. They were here and then they were gone. And you can't reverse it and you can't undo it. And it doesn't how good, matter how good your computer guy is, what schools he went to, all of that. It's over in a second. Well, the, well, this is what's fascinating as well is the Bitcoin ETF. Yeah, that's true. But an Ethereum ETF, because it's proof of stake, you have such large hordes of it sitting in BlackRock and the other ETFs that they can go to the other ETFs and say, hey, let's reverse the transaction. And they'll reorg the chain because they own so they hold so much of it, which means that they control the voting power. And this this is why proof of reserve is really scary for this traditional mechanisms like ETFs. I, I think, and this is why proof of proof of work is probably superior in that sense. I know you guys won't like it, but it sounds like a bug, but it might be a feature. That does sound what large financial institutions would like if they had a magical oopsie button, if one of their brothers was hacked, especially for hundreds of millions of dollars, you know, devastating results. Uh, bad for the hacker, you know, who found the loop. Good for the financial institution. So if we were to compare Bitcoin and Ethereum ETFs, as much as I know Josh is saying it's a negative, it might be seen as a positive. So that'll be interesting to see how that turns out. Uh, we got a couple more small, short, quick stories. Uh, we're going to continue our SegWit and a UASF victory tour here as Coinbase, one of the companies that was against SegWit, that was against UASF, that was in favor of SegWit 2X, which had bad code that broke a few weeks into its running, has again officially capitulated to the Lightning Network the Lightning Network is being added to Coinbase. People can now use it and maybe stop uh, ignoring it and excluding it from their mainstream media articles when they talk about Bitcoin. Uh, let's go to threesomes really quick. What do you think about Coinbase adding the Lightning Network and again, completely giving in from the block size war victory to UASF and uh, SegWit? Uh, I think it was bound to happen, honestly. Yeah, uh, didn't come as a surprise, but I, th I think... Uh... I don't think they were going to get in, their, get in their own way on that one. I was surprised they waited so long. I'm always surprised when they do capitulate because they are such a rich and powerful organization, even though they started off uh, down the hall from one of my failed startups. Uh, but yes, it's great to see them come around. And as, as much as it's fun to make fun of them and push them under the water and so forth, they're a big company, they're a Bitcoin supporting company, and now they're supporting Lightning. So we do welcome them back. Uh, Victoria Jones, what do you think about Coinbase giving in and accepting the Lightning Network, perhaps the one of the true ends of the block size war here? Yeah, I think it's fantastic news and uh, just goes to show, you know, from the block size wars, just, you know, how important that discussion was. And, and uh, you know, we won and uh, the the success and the victory is now following through. And uh, ultimately, I think that's a good thing for humanity. So, yeah. 
Coinbase has had to capitulate and uh, hopefully that won't be the last battle that they lose because uh, I'm quite sure there'll be more in the future. <laughs> Josh Chagall, a long time ago, I made a list of all the companies in favor of SegWit and opposed, and it was just mad Bitcoin and like Dishwalla or Oddwalla or something that was with us. And uh, all the other ones all opposed it. And now everything has changed. What do you think, Josh? The digital currency group, Coinbase, the, the founders, the, the kings, accepting Lightning Network. Yeah. I, um... You know, people bag Lightning Network. Uh, I think it's got a lot of uh, a lot of problems still. Uh, I, I wish it had moved faster, but I think a lot of it was psychological. I think a lot of it, because of the block size wars, people just didn't want to give it a go. And uh, I I do find it's it's scary because it's a lot more custodial um, than than base layer. It doesn't have to be. You can run your own node, and um, and th that way uh, you are actually custodian of your channel. But um, it it isn't the panacea. But I do think if you have a if you zoom out, actually, I just got the chart here. Uh, we now have three hundred four million dollars locked up in value uh, within the Lightning Network. So um, uh, it, it it's it's growing a lot and a lot of the past it's been just basically the bear market you know uh since 2023 uh no uh, halfway through 2022 to 2020 almost 2024 it was pretty much going sideways in terms of tvl uh so and it's been going up with the bull market obviously the bull market you know goes up in dollar value because it's the bull market so it's kind of a weird metric i'd I'd like to see tvl in terms of units of bitcoin and, and what's happening there uh, I, i'm still trying to find that uh, i can't find it right now but um yeah so it's uh i think it's it's really important that we find layer two more layer two solutions because humans are insatiable in terms of how much data they want to put onto the onto a cheap blockchain this is the this is the false narrative that gets uh, uh pumped out of there constantly is that you if you, uh, you you know our blockchain's super cheap oh yeah all right well wait until you're actually mainstream and used because everyone will put weather data uh my my apple watch data they'll just chuck everything in there if it's cheap enough the only thing that can stop it is price. So, and the other way to to stop that is to have as many layer twos as possible, as many layer twos as possible, because that way you can then scale um, outwards. So you can have uh, uh, dedicated use cases for certain things. The 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 pro that does comes with problems as well, though, because you start to separate liquidity, and we're seeing that in in, in the Ethereum space that liquidity becomes very very uh fragmented across all of these layer twos so you don't have mega deep liquidity on one single l2 you have uh some liquidity here some liquidity there and some liquidity there so you might need to buy uh smaller amounts um this becomes a problem for large institutions but uh from the ground level it's not that problem and people are working on it um there are cross-chain aggregators working very very hard to try to uh, pull this together so maybe a transaction just takes longer as uh, but as these bridges get faster uh, we, that might even go away so there's there's a lot of work happening uh, crypto cryptographic work as well to try and prove ways of uh, finalizing or having more finality in a shorter space uh, while not uh, not breaking them breaking the uh the safety so yeah L l2s are important lightning network's important um it's it, it didn't really work on the ethereum space the 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 lightning network concept uh rather what worked is just adding more uh, well in the bitcoin language side chains or drive chains or other other chains like that it's not the best ux i gotta say having l2s the best ux is l1 uh, just base layer and that's why people are so pissed at the whole thing it's like 
I'm just used to be able to say send and it works and I can see it and it's gone. Um, L2s is annoying. Uh, the UX is terrible. So if there's, you know, really good UX designers out there, there's a massive opportunity there. If you can make a good user experience uh, while interfacing with L2s, then you're going to be very, very successful. And we're running out of time. We do have a couple more issues. Avenge Sevenfold Season Pass is turning heavy metal fans into blockchain evangelists. And I just thought this was a really cool issue. Uh, it's a heavy metal band. I've, I've never heard of them. I'm sure they're great. Uh, they have their own Death Bats NFTs. They have token gated ticket sales with Ticketmasters. And now they're having a season pass where fans can subscribe and get rewards, activities linked to the band. Uh, it just sounds like a really cool use of blockchain, Web3, and NFT technology. Uh, threesome, what do you think about Avenge Sevenfold and their interesting uh, season pass? I, I think they're established enough that they could do it, okay? Um, they've got the, the the history and the success that they're, they're not going to put their their rise in, in jeopardy, right? But I think this is what we're going to see more and more. I, I think blockchain is for ticketing whether it's sports or or concerts is going to be one of the easiest use cases for for most people to to enjoy and i think that that all that's possible you know the the nice thing that they're doing is they let these fans have their experience build up you know collect the 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 pieces of their fandom essentially and then because they're they're on on chain they can sell them and 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 deal with them individually right so it's not dependent on a a, a driving ecosystem that does it it lets the the fans sort of take control of their own experience and and i think that's the key that that's understood here but i think i think we're going to see it across all entertainment and I, I think it's a great thing to see i agree i'm excited to see these ideas in practice we used to theorize about these ideas and we said yeah if you're a band you could sell a subscription you could sell tickets and people could collect the digital ticket stubs you know in the same way they collect the real ticket stubs uh, but like you're saying, the big part about that is being in a separate system. If this was happening at Ticketmaster.com and you could only sell them through Ticketmaster, if, if you sold one for 100K, they take a giant cut, they close down the market, they investigate you. There's all kinds of things they'd have to do if they own the market. Whereas what's neat about this is you kind of put it off on its own chain, on its own system, and then people decide if they want to buy it. People decide if they want to resell it uh, rather than one company. Absolutely. And, and I think... That's that's always been the case. We, we will see, you know, even you know whether it's a, a live nation or or you know the big promoters sort of coming together and taking different clients and assembling them into mini markets. That's going to happen, and it, it's not a bad thing necessarily because determining that that the Avenged Sevenfold fans can figure out an entire marketplace ecosystem of their own is a stretch. But I think that that you know as you know the the singer's talking about it that that you know he sees young bands that are coming in this now being used to blockchain technology and being used to these things starting out from this way that's where we're really going to see the change drive and I, in sports in particular you know we can talk about that another time but the the baseball aspect of it and the ticketing aspect and the experience but it's it's there and it's coming it's good to see well and while you said this is an established band and certainly not financial advice but the dream on this is that you would come up with the band and you would see them at a small venue and you would buy the early nfts or the early album support or whatever it's going to be and you'd have this little thing of collectibles and it would keep you even closer to the band where you're not just attending shows you're collecting part of it and then in the early days when they need money for gas for the van you know you are financing the van you band and uh, i think that could be really exciting for people and to be involved at that level uh but again everyone has to make their own choice oh internet's back great uh victoria jones what do you think about nfts and a band like avenge sevenfold selling a season pass and having all of these options to promote their music yeah well i'm all for innovative ideas it'll be interesting to see how it plays out i mean i'm not I'm not culturally involved with, uh, you know, that kind of music or even the music scene uh, in particular. It's never been a particular interest of mine, but uh, yeah, it looks very interesting and uh, I'll be interested to see how it plays out. Yeah, I, I have a fascination with with ticketing because it's been there's been countless uh, projects trying to break that that concept and it's never really taken off and, and i don't know why because um 
it makes a lot of sense. Like I, as an art, if I was an artist, I don't know what to price my tickets at. I could guess, but I'm probably going to get it wrong because there's no market. I'm just setting the market and what tends to happen. And it used to drive me insane. You have like, uh, uh, I'm guessing we're still live, uh, but uh, yeah, we, the problem is that you, you go to buy a ticket. Like I remember wanting to go see Rage Against the Machine and it, it would sell out in seconds. Um, uh, or it wouldn't sell out. You just, it would, the website wouldn't work and you have this long line waiting or they'd have to like sell it in blocks or it was just a nightmare when really what, what is important there is price surging. You need price surging to, because that's the market saying, uh-uh, there's, there's, there's a line here and markets don't like lines. True free markets get rid of lines and queues because they price the, the, they price it in. So it sucks because, you know, all the equity people would be like, oh yeah, but only the wealthy get it now. Yeah. But this is just what, this is how you price scarcity. Um, and, and so uh, this is what happens. So you, uh, if you have price surging and secondary markets, you can say, you can put your tickets up for sale. And then the, the scalpers actually play a good role now because they, they find a proper price for your thing. And maybe with an NFT, you can take a cut from the scalpers in the secondary markets. Um, and at the end of the day, the next concert you have, you can now look at the historical pricing and go, okay, well, it looks like I should have raised my prices a lot more. Uh, because the secondary market was going for, you know, three times more than what the original price was. So uh, I can sell it for more. And maybe the secondary markets will then lose out because they'll reprice back down or no one will show up. So um, I, I think it's it just makes absolute sense to have more of a secondary market on ticketing because it's always been a bit of a, an annoyance where it's either too cheap and, and uh you know that that you, you don't get a ticket because there's this massive line or way too expensive and then no one rocks up to your show <laughs> so let, let me tag yeah, that real I, quick hit that real yeah. quick so the neat thing about the like, fan engagement aspect of it not just in price discovery of the marketplace okay but for example if if you've got an event that that takes off the, the secondary market goes you know 10x and and all of a sudden you know, everybody's clamoring to sell because they're making such a profit. The band could see via blockchain who the fans were that didn't do that, who actually bought the ticket and used it and went to the next show and that. And you could see loyalty there via blockchain that could track yeah. the true fans, not just the ones that are there, you know, making the quick buck. And then re re reward those holders via blockchain and, and wallet connectivity and say, okay, you've come to the shows, you bought the ticket, you showed up at the show, you didn't succumb to the secondary pressures, and then you you get extra access or early access or what have you. And so, you know, that sort of customer management or fan management that's available by watching what happens, that's what I do with, with my art. I know who buys it originally, who sells it on the secondary, what they paid for, all of that. By taking all that into account, it changes that fan experience. So true. So true. Very, very valid point. And, and, you know, since the rise of TikTok, uh, because uh, this whole follower thing uh, through uh, has been really important for creators, right? You get these followers, whether it's on Twitter or whether it's on YouTube, and you can c continue engaging with these followers. The problem with what happened with TikTok is they went, oh, we don't need subscribers. We we'll get rid of the subscribe button and we'll just algorithmically show you things that we think you'll want. And so the followers drop away. This sort of thing, and, and I think it's really important to have uh, uh, for artists an engaged community that, they, that, that they've that they got that they can continually uh, talk to. And and this is what blockchains uh, allow as well. As what you Exactly what you were saying there is to keep that engagement, keep that uh, follow aspect uh, where you can see what's happening uh, through through on-chain data yeah it's it's a really great point well yeah uh, important one hmm. well i think the zoom client uh updated itself in the middle of uh the show so that's good so i'm kind of back uh but we have one more issue we we're going to talk about uh uh in nottingham they had a bitcoin fest and uh, they say they went really well there's this cool video 
got a bunch of people we know in it. Uh, so we're just going to go to Victoria Jones, just a, a quick rehab. How did it go? A recap. Uh, how did it go at Bitcoin Fest in Nottingham, England? Yeah, it was fantastic, actually. It was a real um, grassroots effort in order to put something together, uh, mainly for the local community. Uh, it started because uh, the lo we recently located our meetup there and uh, a lot of the football club were people in the football club were asking what this Bitcoin thing was. So the idea was to try and educate the local community. And yeah, it was great fun. You know, people really came together in order to make it a success. And uh, the organizers put in a lot of work. I did a series of interviews before the event uh, just to help introduce people to the speakers because they weren't necessarily well known. And it was really great. And, um, you know, following on from that, uh, I've just passed on a, um, a message, uh, well, an article from BBC News. Apparently the... Winklevoss twins have just invested 3.6 million in Bitcoin in Real Bedford uh, Football Club. So uh, this is a, could be a, a sign of things to come for uh, football clubs and uh, cryptocurrency uh, developments. So, um, yeah, watch the space. Nice. Very cool. Glad to uh, hear the event went well. And congratulations to the football club. That sounds like a great uh, investment. Uh, but we're running out of time, so we're going to head towards the end here. Uh, so we're going to go to prediction or story of the week. Threesome, are you ready with a prediction or a story of the week? Go ahead. Sure thing. Um, I guess the story of the week is is uh, that I've got the the big transit, the 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 movement, the big migration taking place as I leave the Tezos blockchain behind uh, and and move full force into to Ethereum and the base uh, layer two. So we'll be it's a combined force there. But um, it's got my project, All Abuzz, ahead of the having, And uh, it's sort of our big focus is migration to ETH. So that's all we've been talking about for a couple of months. And uh, it, it continues to be the, the story of the of the time. Very cool. And uh, so, where can people so are you uh, check to... out your... Go ahead. Sorry, Jeff. Okay. Sorry, uh, just a quick question. So are you moving to base as in uh, the Coinbase's uh, L2 or Ethereum base layer? Both of them. <laughs> But so no, it's, like it. yeah, both of them because I've got some some additions that we do in the hundreds of thousands, and and there's a lot of transactional stuff. So so the the non-existent gas fees on on base the layer two um, is really helpful, but the the majority of the collection stays on on ETH. The the more uh, awesome, so. excellent. And for uh, those who haven't heard or haven't checked it out, Threesome's got his own NFT baseball league. Uh, you can buy and sell players. You can be a manager of a team. Uh, where can people learn more about this if they want to check it out? Uh, the Discord is just Discord uh, slash Grotto. And the Grotto is is the the centerpiece of uh, the whole project. So that's where we meet up and and do it all up. Very cool. Thanks, uh, Threesome, for being here. I uh, checked out like a draft once. It was very exciting. They were doing like a random number generator and people were winning or losing. And uh, it just sounds like a really fun engagement activity to have with nfts that they're not just uh you know baseball cards that you own but they're players on a team and they win and they lose and all of that stuff i think it's really cool stuff thanks appreciate it Tom. that's awesome all right and victoria jones a prediction or a story of the week go ahead uh well you kind of uh took my story of the week from me already i didn't realize you're going to mention the bitcoin fest but yeah it was the bitcoin fest that we had last weekend which really was a which was a great event. Um, I was also running the live stream with uh, my daughter and uh, that's available on my YouTube channel, satoshispage.com. So uh, if you're interested in uh, what the speakers had to say, then uh, that's worth looking at. The video quality, we struggled a bit because the Wi-Fi connection wasn't great, but we had a clear display of the slides and you can still hear what people are saying. So uh, yeah, check it out. And uh, obviously we've got this little montage, which has been put together by one of the video guys. Apparently uh, he videoed the talks as well. So they're going to be coming out in the future. So, uh, so yeah, more to come from that. And uh, we're really excited. We're going to try and plan a similar event for next year as well. It does make a big difference if you run a Bitcoin event during the bull market or in the bear market. I know we went to a, a bit Brum in Birmingham and it was a great event. And Joe did a great job. Uh, but he said, yeah, if only you'd been here two years ago, things were amazing. And and it just must be so hard for these organizers. They do great work. They set up everything up in advance. And sometimes you have a huge day. Sometimes you have a small day. And it's really much more about the market than any work that you did or didn't do as an organizer. So 
It's great to see where yeah, we're turning is, to that. That's what's always been hard for uh, for Mallorca blockchain days. It, it, somehow they've always timed it just wrong. <laughs> Yeah. But it's kept it really nice and niche and small, which has been fun for the for the people going. It's really good because you get really top quality people, uh, very very smart people uh, doing great stuff in the space, all being able to talk uh, to each other, uh, which is which is great. Oh, oh gosh, just you have lost Thomas. your sound now. Thomas is having a bad tech day, everyone, <laughs> but. Uh, uh <laughs> there he is he's back no he's not back all right well i'll round it off thank you very much to everybody until next time bye bye <laughs>